So in this video, we're going to look at the general structure of a synovial joint. And this is the third structural classification of a joint. We talked about fibrous, cartilaginous, now synovial. So the synovial joint is actually a special joint because it's where bones are separated by, uh, you know, actually a fluid-filled joint cavity. And this joint cavity, which is full of fluid, is synovial fluid, but that's lined and sort of supported and encased by a synovial membrane. Now it's important to have this fluid filled joint cavity because all synovial joints are diarthrotic or freely movable. So when you think about the most movable joints of your body, like your shoulder, your hip, your knee, your elbow, your interphalangeal or like joints between your fingers, those are all synovial joints which are considered diarthroses or freely movable. Now uh, includes pretty much all the joints of your limbs and uh, the characteristics of synovial joints are, are interesting. We'll talk about those coming up soon. And we also have specialized synovial tissues like bursa and tendon sheaths that are associated with tissues that also move a lot. Now, uh, in terms of their stability, they're influenced by three major factors that we'll talk about coming up soon. But remember, synovial joints are highly movable, which means they're also less stable. Remember, there's a trade-off between mobility and stability. If you have a very movable joint, it's often the least stable. And we'll talk about that as well. So in terms of the general structure of a synovial joint, uh, for one, they're going to have this articular cartilage because they're going to include long bones. And these long bones are going to have hyaline cartilage at the places where the joints occur, or articulations. And the purpose of this articular cartilage is actually to prevent um, sort of crushing of the ends of the bones. And so that actually allows for some cushioning between those bones. And that way there's a nice sort of hyaline cushion between those bones at the joint. Now, uh, we also find that synovial joints have a joint cavity, also called the synovial cavity, and it's full of synovial fluid. Now, this actual cavity is pretty small, but it's full of fluid, and it's a potential space, and that's actually filled with this synovial fluid, which is a lubricant. Now, synovial fluid is mostly water and some uh, hyaluronic acid, and it's going to be kind of viscous, which gives it a nice lubrication uh, characteristic. Now, uh, articular cartilage, or articular capsule rather, is the joint capsule which actually surrounds and encases this synovial cavity. Now, it's two layers thick. We have an external fibrous layer and an internal synovial layer. The fibrous layer is what's outside of the joint, and it really surrounds and encases this synovial joint to hold it together nicely. And it's made of a dense, irregular connective tissue, which is tough. Now, the inner layer of this articular or joint capsule is the synovial membrane. Now the synovial membrane is what lines the inner surfaces of the synovial joint and this is made of a loose connective tissue which actually makes synovial fluid and it secretes this by basically filtering blood plasma. Now synovial fluid is this viscous slippery filtrate of plasma and hyaluronic acid. It lubricates and nourishes the articular cartilage and what's interesting is that it nourishes articular cartilage. We talked about our cartilage is avascular. And now what's cool then is that for the cartilage you find within synovial joints, every time you compress that synovial fluid by like, you know, bearing weight on the joint, uh, which what's really neat then is that the synovial fluid gets forced into the cartilage to nourish it. And then when you take compression off of that joint and it relaxes, that synovial fluid can actually rush out of the cartilage back into the joint cavity. And it's this sort of tidal movement of synovial fluid that uh, allows for nourishment of the cartilage. Now, we also find phagocytic cells that can remove microbes and debris if that occurs, because we need this to be a lubricant. Now, there's different types of reinforcing ligaments for synovial joints as well. We have capsular ligaments, which are part of the fibrous layer of the articular capsule. We have extra capsular ligaments, which are found outside of the articular capsule, and they basically just support the joint from the outside. And then intracapsular ligaments, which are actually found within the joint itself. So an example of an intracapsular ligament would be like the anterior cruciate ligament of your knee, because you actually find this within the joint cavity itself, which means it's going to be surrounded by uh, synovial fluid and covered with synovial membrane. So uh, we also find that synovial tissues have nerves and blood vessels. So if you damage synovial tissue, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful. But it also is involved with monitoring your joint position and stretch, which we'll come back to in the nervous system chapter. Now, we have lots of capillary beds within synovial tissue. That way, they're able to nourish the synovial membrane, and you actually filter that blood plasma or the fluid of your blood to make synovial fluid. So if you look at this picture here, this is showing a typical synovial joint. And imagine this could be like the articular surfaces of, uh, let's say, like between your finger bones. 
Now if you look here, we see that they have a long bone and another long bone, and they're cut in cross section. So what you're looking at is basically compact bone that lines the outside, got some spongy bone inside. We have this epiphyseal line, which used to be the growth plate. And we talked about at the epiphysis, at the very end of the epiphysis, we have articular cartilage. Now the articular cartilage here is actually gonna protrude into the synovial cavity or joint cavity, and this allows for some cushioning between the joints. Now the actual joint cavity itself is surrounded by this articular capsule or joint capsule. And this actually would go all the way around the joint. That's what's gonna hold this synovial fluid in place. So there's two layers of this articular capsule or joint capsule. We have the fibrous layer, which is a dense irregular connective tissue, and then a synovial layer, which is actually made of synovial membrane, which is a connective tissue membrane that looks like epithelium. But basically what it does is it takes blood plasma and it filters that across to make synovial fluid, which you find filling the joint cavity. Now synovial fluid is kind of a viscous, slippery solution, which doesn't have a lot of protein and it doesn't have a lot of cells, there's mostly just water, electrolytes, and uh, hyaluronic acid uh, within this solution. Now, uh, what we find then too are some supporting ligaments like extracapsular ligament here. And we know this is an extracapsular ligament because you find this outside of the joint. And if there were ligaments inside of the joint cavity, we actually would call those intracapsular ligaments, but they're not shown here. So uh, in terms of other structural features of synovial joints, we can have fatty pads, which are actually going to help for, to provide some cushioning between uh, joint spaces. And then the articular discs are also called menisci, which are basically little rings of fibrocartilage that help to fit between the ends of the bones and they help stabilize the joint. They also help reduce wear and tear. So you're going to find a lot of articular discs between you know, uh, joints that are going to bear a lot of weight. So an example of where you would find a meniscus or articular disc is actually in the knee. So in the knee joint, we actually have the lateral and medial menisci, which are basically just little rings of fibrocartilage that help to cushion within that joint itself. Now, uh, we also find that there's bursa and tendon sheets. Now, these are really interesting examples of where you can find synovial membrane outside of joints. And instead, bursa and tendon sheets really support uh, other skeletal tissues. So think of a bursa as like a bag of synovial fluid that lubricates like, you know, like a ball bearing. And it's not strictly part of synovial joint, but it's usually closely associated. So an example of where you'd find like a bursa would be like uh, surrounding muscles or between a tendon and skin or uh, between two bones uh, near a joint. So uh, this actually provides some additional lubrication uh, in tissues that surround joints. Now we also find that there are tendon sheets, which are elongated bursa that wrap completely around tendons. And you find this around tendons that are subjected to a lot of friction, like especially in the wrist, you're gonna find a lot of tendon sheets to lubricate those wrist tendons. So this is showing an example of a bursa here in the, uh, basically in the shoulder joint. Now this bursa here is structured a lot like a water balloon, and it basically will roll around uh, within that joint uh, to basically help to lubricate the uh, you know, a chromium of your scapula and the head of the humerus here. That way you don't get extra friction between these tissues that are, that are around the joint. So bursa help to support joints and by providing additional areas of lubrication. Now we also find tendon sheets. So you might, you might find then that like near this joint, you could have things like the tendon of like the long head of, tri of biceps brachii. But because this tendon moves a lot, you can find a tendon sheath, which is basically a synovial membrane that surrounds the tendon. That way the tendon can rub back and forth, but it's gonna be lubricated uh, by the synovial membrane so you don't have a lot of friction around these tendons that move quite a bit. So if you look at the structure of a bursa, remember it's like a bag of synovium, and it will roll with the joint. So when the head of your humerus rolls, when you move your arm around, uh, or your shoulder joint around rather, <clears throat> this basically this bursa is gonna roll around and help to lubricate between these tissues. That way you don't get friction rub. So there's three factors that influence the stability of synovial joints. And this is important to consider because we said that synovial joints were all diarthrotic. Now if they're diarthrotic, that means that they are freely movable. But we said that highly movable joints are often the least stable. So to talk about uh, synovial joint stability refers to, you know, well, how do we just keep this joint together? Well, some important factors would include, first of all, the shape of the articular surface. Like, what is the shape of the bones? 
in terms of uh, joint stability. You find that for the most part, this has a pretty minor role, but with like ball and socket joints, this is gonna be where you have a ball that sits in a basically a socket shaped bone, and this is gonna provide some stability here. Now, we also have supporting ligaments, and the more ligaments, the stronger the joint's gonna be. Now, these ligaments also have kind of a limited role as well because they can only do so much to keep those joints together. And if you remember, we have different types of ligaments. We have capsular, extracapsular, and intracapsular ligaments. And then muscle tone is the most important uh, component here. Now, muscle tone is different in physiology than if, maybe if you learned uh, you know, like from popular culture. Uh, muscle tone is actually uh, basically like a, a resting amount of muscle tension that your muscles can produce. And so your muscles always are in a state of contraction, even if you think that they're relaxed. And so this muscle tone helps to basically pr produce this steady state of contraction and tension on tendons. And tendons are taut as they cross joints, which basically helps keep those bones in normal position. If you lose muscle tone, joints can subluxate or become partially dislocated. So muscle tone is an important factor to basically help keep these joints in normal position. So this table actually goes into some of the different types of classifications of joints throughout the body. So if you look here, we have, remember, like the, the cranial sutures, which are a fibrous joint. This is actually going to be a, a synarthrosis because they're immovable. We talked about how the atlanto-occipital joint of your skull is a synovial joint, and it's also diarthrotic, so it allows for a lot of movement here at this neck joint. Uh, we talked about how the intervertebral discs of your vertebrae all along your spine are a type of cartilaginous joint, which are uh, going to be a symphysis because they're made of fibrocartilage. And they're also going to be slightly movable because they're amphiarthrotic. Uh, the, um, the types of joints where your ribs meet the vertebrae uh, are also going to be synovial joints. And because of that, they're going to be diarthrotic, so it allows for some movement of your ribs. Uh, we find that like places like the sternoclavicular joint here, like where the sternum and clavicle meet, is also a synovial joint. And it's also freely movable, which makes sense because if, uh, if your clavicle is part of the pectoral girdle that supports your upper appendage, if you touch your clavicle and move your arm around, you can feel your clavicle moving quite a bit against the sternum here. And then we have our uh, sternocostal joint where basically the ribs meet the sternum. This is also a cartilaginous joint, but because it's made of hyaline cartilage, we consider this a synchondrosis where uh, basically the bones are united by uh, hyaline cartilage. Now this is a synarthrotic joint, so these bones don't move a lot against each other, but the cartilage can expand a little bit. Now other places where you find joints throughout the body, when you start talking about appendages, really these are going to be uh, synovial joints, right? So when you look at, look at an appendage, they're synovial joints because they move quite a bit. And uh, again, appendages are synovial joints because they move quite a bit. Now we also talked about the pubic symphysis here, which is also a, a cartilaginous joint. It's a fibrocartilage, which makes it a symphysis joint, and it's going to be slightly movable. That way there's some cushioning between your os coxae when you walk. And we talked about how the distal tibial fibular articulation here is a type of fibrous joint called a syndesmosis because this is going to be uh, a, a ligament. And ligaments are technically syndesmoses, which is longer connective tissue fibers that allow for a little bit of movement. But in this example, it's a synarthrosis, which is basically going to be immovable.